Well, what happens ever since we started as a church in 2001, typically the last weekend of January, we hold a business meeting in the afternoon. And so I've sought to make it a practice to deal with money, finances, wealth, giving in the morning hour. As much as Christ said about money, we probably proportionately do not deal with it enough. But, because we live in an hour where greed is so prevalent in our land and where financial scandal seems to attend so many men who stand in the pulpit, and because we came here to the east side of San Antonio, to a part of the city that financially speaking is probably on the poor end of the spectrum when you look at the financial makeup of our entire city, I've never wanted us to come to this part of the city to in any way be inviting the people from these neighborhoods to come to our church and make it at all seem that we were primarily interested in their money. And so, not have, some people come here and they're surprised. You guys don't have an offering. Well, that's on purpose. And isn't it amazing? In all these years, we've never had one plate-passing offering, and yet, our church has never lacked. I mean, the Lord has just been faithful. But I do want to talk about money at times, especially on this one Sunday of the year, because the Scripture do say so much about it. Today, I don't think in these, <clears throat> where, where are we? 14? Um, in these 13 years that we've been a church, I don't think I've ever brought the message on this last Sunday of January, from the book of Proverbs. But that's where I want to go today. The book of Proverbs. You can turn in, in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. This is a unique set of verses in that it is the first place in Proverbs that speaks about wealth. Now there are some things said about treasure and silver prior to this in the book of Proverbs, but it's not said specifically with re reference to wealth and treasure. It's spoken specifically with reference to wisdom. And that wisdom ought to be sought and searched for as for silver and hidden treasure. This is the first teaching, direct teaching in the book of Proverbs with regards to money, wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And with the first fruits of all your produce, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now, what I find especially interesting about the book of Proverbs is the extent... I mean, think with me here. What does Proverbs deal with? If, if you were to say, give one word to identify Proverbs, what would that word be? Wisdom. What, what, what was the other answers? Instruction. Which is very closely related. What, did somebody else give another answer? Knowledge. And those are, those are all very closely related. But wisdom, we call this one of the books of wisdom literature. It deals with wisdom. If you look at Proverbs 1, 
the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing. There's wise. Dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance. You can see it. But let me tell you something. If you go through this book and you begin to look specifically what is it that God would have us to be wise in? What are some of the things that are brought out in the book of Proverbs over and over and over and over again? Well, but instruction in what? Speaking, the tongue, and we might bring out other things. Work, diligence, companionship, counsel. One of the big things is money. Money is dealt with. I've written... In, in this Bible here, I've written a dollar sign next to every place. There's a lot of them. You go through the book of Proverbs and you do that. Here is a book that deals with wisdom. Here is a book that has a lot to say on the subject of money. You know what that tells me? That tells me that to be wise by God's standard is in no way disconnected from how we handle the wealth that God entrusts to us. And I want to bring these two concepts together. Wisdom and money. Wisdom and money. When you put them both together, what do you get? You get this. Honor the Lord with your wealth. That's the the first thing said here. That's the title of my sermon. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, I I want us to think about wisdom in a general sense before we, we really tie this together. Wisdom. As we think about wisdom and money, there's a really fascinating verse, at least fascinating to me, in Proverbs 4 7. There are, I, there are probably 10 or 15 verses in the Proverbs you ought to all know. This may very well be one of them. It's one of them for me. I mean, you go through and you just pull out some of the ones that contain... The beauty of the Proverbs is their conciseness and just how much wisdom. Look at this. Proverbs 4-7. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Or if you've got the King James, it's wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. But But the whole thing is get wisdom. Wisdom, right? When you go look at Scripture, it says that we are to search for it. Look at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 4. If you seek it, what's the it? This is wisdom, like silver. Search for it as hidden treasure. You can apply this to every aspect of life. The beginning of wisdom in marriage is what? Get marital wisdom. I mean, that's the starting point. Get it. Seek for it. You know, the the wisest people in this world, they didn't get wise by chance. They sought for it. Wisdom is something that has to be searched out. It has to be dug up. It has to be searched as for silver or for hidden treasure. Hidden treasure means you have to unearth it. You have to uncover it. You have to find it out where it is. You have to go after it. If you're going to get financial wisdom, what's the beginning of that knowledge? Well, get it. But what does that mean? What does it mean to get wisdom? I think we can all agree that wisdom is a good thing to get, but what does it mean to get it? Get wisdom. The truth is, this is probably not the easiest word in the world to define. How would you define it? One of the reasons that it may not be the easiest to define is because it kind of has a broad use in Scripture. Like, think, think about this. Be not wise in your own eyes. Is wisdom even always a word that can be used 
in a good sense. What is it to be wise in your own eyes? That's probably not a good thing. Eve looked at this tree over here and she saw that the fruit hanging on it was able to make one wise. I don't know what kind of wisdom that gave. Undoubtedly, that is an increase in understanding of certain things. What did they come to understand when they ate it? They were naked. But that may not be a wisdom necessarily that we want to search after. Do you know magicians and sorcerers in Scripture, often called wise men? Now, I don't know what kind of wisdom they had, but I'm not thinking that that is necessarily a good type of wisdom. Do you remember the guys that fashioned Aaron's clothing? It specifically says that God gave them a spirit of wisdom. There it has to do with a skill. Having a skill. You remember the wise men that came from the east and sought out Christ. Now whether they were magicians and sorcerers, I don't know if it means that, but whatever wisdom they had, there seemed to be some some goodness about that. We have words. um, Job. Job said, wisdom is with the aged. Where are you at, Papa? You believe that? Elihu came along and said, it isn't. Because he had some of these guys here that were saying a bunch of things and he waited and let them speak and he said, it is not the old who are wise. Jeremiah says that the Messiah would act wisely. Paul calls Christ, he says that He became for us wisdom from God. You know that in 1 Corinthians. Isaiah says that the spirit of wisdom and understanding rests upon Christ. Most of us know well the proverb that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What are, what are words that are often synonymously used with wisdom, closely or interchangeably closely related to wisdom? Instruction, knowledge, understanding, intelligence, insight, prudence, discretion, learning, counsel, skill, discernment, justice, equity, righteousness. Those are all words that in Scripture you can find closely associated with the word wisdom. But what's the essential idea behind wisdom? Well, it has to do with this. It has to do with how we deal all the aspects of life, how we think about them, our attitude. Is it a right attitude? Is it right thinking concerning all that we experience? I mean, Scripture speaks this way. Wise dealing. You can see it in Proverbs 1, verse 3. Wise dealing in righteousness, justice, equity. It's got to do with the way we deal with things. Wisdom wisdom has to do with all the affairs of life and using prudence, shrewdness, understanding, knowledge, discretion. I mean, I'm using words like prudence, discretion. What does that mean? We're careful. We're cautious. We examine things. We do things with understanding. We try to get understanding. Understanding of what? I mean, I can understand how to break into a safe, but if I go rob the bank, that may not be wisdom. It's not just Knowledge applied. Some people say, well, what is wisdom? It's applying knowledge. Well, it's applying knowledge in a way that's right. It's applying knowledge in a way that God approves of. Wisdom has to do with moral uprightness, shunning evil. Wisdom has to do with gaining experience in the ways of the Lord. Wisdom has to do with the way you go through life, how you run, the path You select. It's amazing. You go through Proverbs, you know how many times it talks about our path, our way, our steps? Why? Because that's what wisdom has to do with. How we walk through. Wisdom is that understanding which is gotten, it's gained, it's searched out, and then it's applied to life. It's seen the good way, the right way, the safe way. The blessed way, the way of God, the way of life, and walking in it. That's wisdom. The emphasis of wisdom has to do with how we apply our will. I mean, you can't separate wisdom from the will. Because our will is that which does what? What does the will do? 
What's that? What it wants, what it desires. It's that which propels us. It's that which is behind the decisions that we make. Human will. And and it's got to do with the practical matters. Being subject to God. Living in the fear of God. Wisdom has to do with taking God's revealed principles of good and bad. And applying them. Living them out in daily life. The ultimate source of wisdom, we have it here in Proverbs 2.6. The Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. We know Scriptures say, God, Job says, God numbered the clouds by His wisdom. By His wisdom, God founded the earth, it says in Proverbs 3.19. By, the, by His wisdom, God made the world, Jeremiah tells us. Job 12.13, with God are wisdom and might. He has counsel and understanding. I mean, God alone knows wisdom in the truest sense. It's not found in man's speculations and man's theories and man's opinions. God alone must provide wisdom if we are to have it. He ultimately is the source of it. If if you're to be wise, if you're able to discern, choose the best possible ways of righteousness and good, it is because you have learned those ways of righteousness and good from God and you have applied them to life. It's application. It is taking what God reveals and applying it to life. Like I say, it's taking the safe way, the right way, the blessed way, the way of God, the way of life, and walking in that way. And uh, if you look there at Proverbs 2, verse 1, what does it say? Look, look, watch this. My son. Do you know what the author of Hebrews, where Scott was today, tells us? This is God speaking to the Christian. You can take Proverbs that way. We have it on the authority of inspired Scripture. Who is this Lord who disciplines His people as we were looking at in Hebrews 12? It's it's the Lord disciplining His people. This is the Father to the Son. And if you look over at Revelation chapter 3 and and what the words that are spoken to the Laodicean church, we see it's the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. This is the Lord speaking to My Son, if you receive My words and treasure up My commandments with you, Making your ear attentive to wisdom. There it is. Inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And notice this, and find the knowledge of God. The truest wisdom for man involves knowing God Himself. But okay, Wisdom. But here's something I want you all to get. Because this has to do with you personally. It's the personal aspect of wisdom. If there is a verse in the Proverbs that I think is worth your memorizing, it is Proverbs 9 and verse 12. I find this to be one of the most striking aspects about wisdom. It's the personal aspect of it. Proverbs 9.12 If you are wise, what does it say? You are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. And jump right over to Proverbs 15.32 You see a similar verse. Whoever ignores instruction does what? Despises himself. You ignore instruction, you're the loser. That's what it says. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. You will chiefly profit from wisdom if you have it. Now, yes, if you're wise, others can profit from your example. That's true. 
Others can profit from your counsel. It'll have an effect on others. But the chief benefit of you having wisdom is for you. But, I mean, that's... Look what Proverbs 9.12 says. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you refuse wisdom, who's going to bear it? Who's going to bear the consequences of you refusing wisdom? You. You can say, me. If I'm foolish, I'm foolish for me. If I'm wise, I'm wise for me. You reject wisdom, you reject it for yourself. Remember, Scripture talks about being wise unto salvation. If you're foolish unto destruction, you alone are going to bear it. If you die in your sins, you alone will suffer the vengeance of a rejected Savior. You will bear it. Now, you know what? This is so simple. But what a truth. What a weighty truth to, to get. If you blow off wisdom, you blow off instruction, you blow off understanding, Scripture says you're a fool. And why primarily? Because it's like a guy who beats his head against a brick wall. It's like, why are you doing that? Don't you know you're only hurting yourself by that? You know, it's, it's, it's like the person who wants to commit suicide to get back at other people. It's like, are you not recognizing that you're doing far more damage to yourself than you are to anybody else? Through my wisdom, through my foolishness, it, although it may undoubtedly affect others, I am the one who primarily is going to reap the harvest one way or the other. Listen to what Job says. Job 22.2 Surely he who is wise is profitable to himself. Our wisdom, our foolishness are our own. Put an ownership tag on it. We must reap the fruit of that for ourselves. And I mean, brethren, think about it. Think with me. Don't we count a person, a man or a woman, wise or foolish, primarily to the extent that his own actions or her own actions, attitudes, lifestyle, prove advantageous or harmful to their own selves? I mean, don't we? When we look around at somebody and, and that we see that they do something, even if there's a cost in the beginning, even if there's a sacrifice in the beginning, but we see that they made the sacrifice, but in the end, I mean, you, you watch a Vietnamese family come over to the United States and, and they make all these sacrifices and they buy this, this laundromat over here and the whole family packs into the back room and they don't have any cars and they all live there and they work there and everything. And before you know it, they own the thing full and clear. And before you know it, they own five of them full and clear. Well, in the beginning, you, looked at, you look at somebody like that and do you say that that's foolish? No. You say that's wise. I mean, the guy that goes out and sniffs glue to get a short little high and he just blasts his brains out, you say, that's really foolish. That's stupid. Why? Because, of, because it's not advantageous for him. The little bit that he gets stacks up to enormous ruin for him. Brother, we, we judge people like that all the time. That's really foolish. And why would we say that? Because we see that this is going to have negative impact on the person that's doing it. I mean, we judge like that all the time. Of course we do. And so does God, does He not? I mean, you think with me about that, what is it, Luke 12? Here's God. He looks over at a man and He says, now, now we're coming to money. He says, you fool. Why? Why does God judge the man in Luke 12 a fool? Why? You know why? Because he was not rich towards God. What did he do? He saved up his money, stuffed it in his barns. He was going to build big barns and save up all this stuff. And God comes along and says to him, you fool. Why? Because what he did was not advantageous for himself. 
Whose is this going to be? Answer, not yours. I mean, that's, God judges that way. God judges whether we're wise or foolish to the extent that our actions and our attitudes and our lifestyle prove to be either advantageous to ourself or harmful to ourself. God counted him a fool precisely to the extent that this own man's actions and attitudes led to his own destitute condition. This night your soul is going to be required of you and you have not done what you ought to do with your money. You have not been rich towards me, which would have been a very wise thing to do. And by the way, it would have come from a heart whose treasure was in the right place. Who actually believed. This applies to money. If you're wise with money, you're wise for yourself. See, this is the thing. I come to Scripture and I find out that what we do with our money has potential to bring enormous amounts of blessing on ourselves. If you are foolish with your money, you are foolish with it for yourself. If you are wise with your money, you are wise with it for yourself. That's the way it is. The sermon today has to do with using our money in the best possible way and the wisest possible way. In the way that's going to bring God's greatest glory and our greatest good. That's being wise for yourself. All true wisdom, all true wisdom always is going to aid us in the furtherance of our own blessing and good and glory. I mean, this is true in this life and, and the life to come. Wisdom by its very nature takes us to the place where God's blessing and God's reward flows. That's, that's the height of wisdom. Now, now look at our text. Here are the first words in God's book of wisdom that pertain to wealth and finances. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And, so we could bring our verb in again. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I mean, just think on this great reality. Your use of money. Now think about it. Your pockets. What you have in there. In your purses, in your wallets, in your bank accounts, in the coming paychecks. It is tied to God's glory. To God's honor. Or to God's dishonor. If you don't use it for His honor. I mean with God, have you ever noticed it's pretty much black and white. If you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not honoring Him, you're dishonoring Him. You don't find neutrality in Scripture. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes people like to think so. Well, you know, I'm not really living for God, but I'm not really living against Him. Don't believe that. Jesus doesn't allow you to go there. You're either storing up treasures in heaven or on earth. You're either serving God or you're serving money. You show where your heart is and it's either with God or it's with this world. You either love God or you love this world. You're either practicing righteousness or you're practicing unrighteousness. You're either born of God or you belong to the devil. You ever notice that? Scripture doesn't allow that middle ground that so many people like to think they can find comfort in. Our money, this, I, I, t this, this is really worth thinking about. God has given our money specifically to be a tool to bring great honor to Him. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Now, think about honor. What is, what is that? To honor is to show a high regard for. It's to treat someone in a manner that indicates that you recognize their superior standing. 
I mean, when we encounter someone of extraordinary worth or prestige, honor is bestowed. How? By what our actions reflect our admiration and respect for them. You can honor the Lord with your wealth. You can dishonor the Lord with your wealth. And Christian, there's no higher motive for how we use our money than this. Is there? I mean, is there anything greater? Is there any greater reality? Is there any greater truth? Is there anything of greater importance than using your money to honor the Lord? If there is, you tell me. What is it? To honor you? That was the fool! I stored up this stuff for me. You fool. You were not rich towards God. There's no greater use. Nothing is greater. That's the highest motive for giving, for how we use our wealth. God's honor. I mean, this is, this is all our best things in this world. I mean, our best possessions in this world. Our best riches in this world. God has given to us in order and for the sake of Him, for the very best of beings of all. He gives us the best things here for the sake of the very best of all beings. And how we use it for Him, honoring Him, that ought to be our chief concern. I mean, we know what honor is, right? We know what honor is. We feel it. And so does God. I mean, come on, you stop by my house, you walk in. If, so, if you come to my house and you walk in and suddenly you see we're eating and a chair is brought for you, and not only that, we're just at the point of serving the meal and my wife tells all of our daughters, clear off these tables and put, not that we have china and real silver, but if, if we did, and she said, put all this you know, regular stuff away. And we, all the china got brought out and all the silver and the real nice glasses and everything and a big plate of steaks got brought over and you saw, we dug through them, we found the biggest, the juiciest one and we stuck it on your plate. And you're looking around the table and the whole family just has these joyous smiles because you could see that they really delight to do it. Would you feel honored? You would feel honored. And rightly so because that's what honor is. And, and you know the thing is, God is feeling that, seeing that, and sensing that all the time by your actions with your money. And the classic example of that in Scripture is in Malachi. Now, don't, don't turn there, but listen. I'm, let me read something to you. God feels honor, and He feels dishonor. In Malachi 1, verse 6, a son honors his father. You see, honor is the issue. A servant honors his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And he's talking about what you give, what you offer. If I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests? You despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised when you offer blind animals in sacrifice. And you know what? There are people who profess to be Christian and what they do with their money shows exactly the same thing going on. They give, they give the remnants. They give what's polluted. Not their best. They give the off-scouring. They give God the crumbs. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Do you see what God's saying? The way your governor experiences honor is the same way I do. The story that I created about you coming to my house, that's how you should walk in wisdom with your money recognizing the Lord is watching. And when you make decisions that go out of your way, like bringing the china out, like bringing the best steak and putting it on your plate, and then having big smiles at it, and I didn't add that just randomly. You think the Lord loves what? 
a cheerful giver. When you make big sacrifices, why? Oh, He is our God. What has He done for us? He sent His Son. He's poured out the blood of His Son on my behalf. How, what good things has my God done for me? Just, do you recognize what you do with your money can just show appreciation? And God is watching when you make decisions that go out of the way to show honor. You pick up again there in Malachi 1.13, halfway through verse 13, you bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring is your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished, Here's the principle. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Do you see how the Lord Himself is making it plain? A government official, like a governor, would easily recognize dishonor. But isn't it amazing? We have this idea. What we wouldn't do to another human being, we'll do to God. What we get is God is watching. And you can honor Him greatly. And He sees it. Brethren, is your giving honor driven? That's wisdom. That is wisdom. The highest priority in all your giving and how you handle wealth, the first fruits of all your increase, is it to God's Honor. You need to be thinking. Wisdom is something that has to be gone after. It has to be dug for. It has to be searched out. We should be searching for ways to honor God with our wealth. You need to be thinking, how can I honor Him? How can I show that He is supreme, that He is superior, that He is majestic, that He is transcendent, that He is worthy? How can I show by the use of my money that I esteem God my greatest treasure? How? We need to be strategizing and seeking that out. You just ask yourself, if we were to sum up your giving over the last year, what you've done with wealth, and listen, you'll notice, I'm not making a case for putting it all in that box. I'm, that box may be part of it, but I'm talking about wisdom applies to all aspects of life. And you are using money in many different aspects besides just walking through those doors and what you put over there. God wants you to honor Him. I mean, you take that fool from Luke and what did he do? What he did with his money was all about Him. Right? God wants us God honor driven by what we do with our money. And that's just wisdom. No higher motive. Brethren, is your giving honor driven? That's the question. And remember this. Remember the wisdom factor that we looked at. He who is wise is what? Wise for himself. Who's wise with money is wise for himself. I mean, do you hear what's said in verse 10? In Proverbs 3, verse 10. Do you hear what's being said there? Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. You say, I don't have a barn, I don't have a vat. <laughs> Maybe not, but I think you get the idea. And, brothers and sisters, if you put a New Testament spin on this, I think Jesus has in mind that you have barns and vats in the heavenly places. Christian, you may not have barns and vats here, but Jesus is very much teaching in various places about an abundance of riches that accumulate in glory. Is that not what we find in Matthew 6? The classic verse in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, 
where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But what? Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do I get it there? Well, it's by using your money here to the honor of the Lord. That's exactly how you get it there. Where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Or how about Luke 12.33? Sell your possessions. Sell them. Give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags. Provide yourselves with money bags. This isn't T.D. Jakes. This is Jesus Christ. Provide yourselves with money bags. And it's not just that you're going to get here. Money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Do you see the wisdom The eternal perspective. If you're wise, be wise for yourself. If you're going to be wise with your money, you want to be honor-driven. And you want to be eternity-driven. That man is a fool and is stupid who only does with his money what amounts to what good can come to him here. That's what the fool in Luke 12 did. How about Luke 14, verse 12? He said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. You see, this doesn't have to do with the offering box at church. This has to do with just even when you have a meal at your home. Lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Uh, He's not promising that you're going to have a Mercedes Benz to drive or that you're going to have your own Learjet, which a lot of these guys today in the health, wealth, prosperity movement want to profit you or promise you riches here and now. That's not what Jesus does. Luke 16, 9. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. You can make friends by the wealth. When we honor the Lord with our wealth, that's the highest of all wisdom. When it comes to handling riches, wealth, finances. Why? I mean, here's the thing. Because God has involved our own good with His own glory. Do you see that? His honor and our honor. Doesn't, doesn't, I mean, don't we have it there in, in uh, what, 1 Samuel 2? Or is it 2 Samuel 2? He honors those who honor Him. It's 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. You remember, this is what was spoken to Samuel to be relayed to Eli, right? I honor those who honor me. That's, that's what we have. we have. God has involved our own good in His glory. So that while we endeavor to promote His honor, what does He do for us? He honors us. When you seek to promote God's honor by your money, what does He do to you? He honors you. He honors you and He gives you treasure. What a, what a glorious God we have. He's just so intimately tied our honor and His honor together so that as we seek to promote the one, He promotes the other for us. It's just, it's amazing. Promote the honor of God, He promotes us. Beloved ones, we're no more wise with regards to money than we're wise for our own souls. And as I said, eternal perspective. Well, let's just ask this question as as we wrap up what are some specific ways by which to honor the lord with our money well do you remember this don't turn there but just listen to these words and you you see if you can draw the principle out here malachi 3 10 bring the full tithe into the storehouse Now, I'm not arguing as New Testament Christians whether or not we should tithe. I believe that it was an Old Testament 
law or institution. But in a wealthy country like America, John Piper's probably right that for the average American to tithe, he's stealing from God. But I don't want to get into that now. But I want you to see the principle behind this. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test. Well, how is God being put to the test? If you come and bring to God, if you give to the various things that do Him honor, how is it putting Him to the test? Well, if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You see? There's a need. You have a need. If I give, that's just going to put me in a deeper need. But God's saying, put me to the test. If you do this, what it really is, is a demonstration of trusting me. Putting God to the test financially means doing things with your money that show that you trust God. That's what it is. How do we honor God with our giving? When we trustingly put God to the test. God says, put me to the test. Repeatedly, with our money, we should be putting God to the test. Not presumptuously. How do you know the difference? Well, I would say what you do without prayer is presumptuous. If you have not sought His wisdom, sought His counsel, prayed about it. Look, you know what we've done as a church? Many of the years, these 13 years we've been a church, you know what we've done? We've come together in the afternoon that last Sunday of January and we've thought about the needs of poor pastors and blind schools, grace houses, people who sit in darkness, the missionaries that take the Gospel to them, the needs of the poor, We've thought about these things and we've said after praying and seeking God and then coming together and voting and in unity saying we think we should give in a committed way. Our church gives more than we commit to on a monthly basis. But we start out the year by making certain monthly commitments. And you know time and again, we've, let's say, I think over this last year, we had... $25,000 roughly of monthly commitment that we voted for as a church. There was a point where we agreed to that. I've gone to Carlos in the past. And I've said, Carlos, how often has our church actually brought that much in on a monthly basis? And you know what the answer has been? Never consecutively. Never in consecutive months. In other words, our church just voted to give an amount to needs in this world. To the spread of the kingdom of Christ. That our church has never consistently brought in on a regular basis. We're trusting the Lord to bring us that much. And do you know that in 13 years, we have never missed a commitment on any month after we've done that. Now, somebody say, that's presumption. I don't think it's presumption for this reason. It could be. If we just flippantly have this meeting and say, oh, that's neat that that's happened for 12... Why don't we just... Whatever. And you just off the cuff. Why don't we... But I think when we've sought the Lord and we've asked the Lord... And then we come together and we seek to make these decisions with discussion and wisdom and unity. And then we've sought the Lord to provide for it. Look, when I go to Scripture and I see Peter going down and catching a fish and taking a coin out of his mouth, when I see Jesus Christ come and tell all the people, have His disciples sit all the people down, and, and 5,000 are fed, 5, men are fed, plus the women and children. On another occasion, 4,000... I'm not getting the feeling that our God is wanting us to believe that it's difficult to get Him to provide for us. 
In fact, when I see that promise that we are to go to the nations and take the gospel and Jesus Christ saying that he'll be with us to the end of the age, I'm getting the feeling that that means he's going to supply our needs as we seek to undertake this missionary endeavor. That's, that's the way I read Scripture. I mean, when I'm going through Scripture and I find God's people went into the wilderness and you know what? They didn't have anything. And yet manna began to come down from heaven and water came out of rocks. Or I see Elijah and he goes to this woman, this widow woman. Here she is collecting some sticks. Why? A couple sticks. She's got the, what's left there in, in, with her oil and her flour and she's going to go prepare one last meal for her and her son and then they're going to die. And Elijah says, you know what? Fix a meal for me first. She's, they're, they're at the end. Fix a meal for me first. She does, and she never ran out. I believe that if we move forward trusting the Lord, we're going to... Don't you think that's a way to honor God? To say, we believe you are Jehovah Jireh. And we are going to make decisions about money. Not because we sat down and we looked at the checkbook ledger. And we said, you know what? Last year, the, the month that we had the least amount of income, it was at this level. And so, we never want to make a commitment beyond that. You see, that's looking at the numbers. And that's trusting in the ledger. And that's trusting in the dollar. And that's trusting in the brethren's ability to give but we look past it and we say, Lord, you've called us to something and we want to honor you. We want to honor you. This isn't about honoring the leaders here who are getting fat off the money that you give. Like I say, we make our financial meetings wide open. We want you to see where the money goes. What kinds of things have we been giving to? Let's think about the next way that we find in Scripture that we're told to honor Him. Proverbs 14.31 Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his Maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors Him. Honors His Maker. We're talking about honoring God. Here's a text that directly says how to honor God. How? How? By taking care of the poor. Not by making the rich richer. Which so many of these preachers. And it's... Who is I? Oh, I was... James just put up a message by Randall Easter on I'll Be Honest. And I was listening to that. And he said, you know, what about Joel Olstein? What about the Pope? And he said, don't you believe they're getting away with anything? Wrath is building up. That's absolutely true. These guys that are filling their pockets full, that are fleecing the sheep, woe unto them. You do not want to... Look at this. Who is generous to the needy honors his Maker. You just go through Proverbs. I'll shoot them out to you. Proverbs 14.21 Blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Proverbs 17.5 Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. Proverbs 19.17 Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 21.13 Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Proverbs 22.9 Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. For he shares his bread with the poor. Proverbs 28.27 Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. How is the Lord honored when we give to the poor? Well, I'll tell you one way. Do you remember how this honor to God takes place in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9? It takes place like this. You have people like the poor saints in Jerusalem. And you have these Macedonians who come along. They're poor themselves, but they give. And you know what happens? The, peop- the saints in Jerusalem praise God. And that's, that's exactly what we're taught there. Listen to how it's said. The ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. That's what happens when you provide for the needs of the poor. And and this is talking about poor Christians. I mean, if there's anybody that we should be reaching out to primarily, first and foremost, it's the poor among God's people. 
And what happens? When you give to them, it just explodes in praise and thanksgiving to God. And He's honored. He's honored by all their thanksgiving. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, God is just glorified because of the thanksgiving that He receives. And remember, brethren, if how does the love of God abide in you if you're able to see our brother sister in need and you don't meet it? I mean, if there should never be a brother or sister in need in this church. Ever. You see what they did in the beginning when that seed of God was in them? They went out and they sold their lands. And they came and they laid it at the foot of the apostles. And you don't see anything about those apostles growing rich like so many of the men today, living in their gated communities and in their mansions. That's not what they did. They distributed it as there was need. There should never be needs. We should, we should respond like the Macedonians who were poor in themselves, but they saw a need there in the poor saints in Jerusalem. And they, they rose up to meet that need. That should be happening in our church all the time. And it doesn't have to go through the church box. It's something you should be doing among yourselves. We don't have to know about it at all. Just one other way that I would say, and this comes back to Luke 12 again, and to that fool. Brethren, you honor God when you deny yourself and when you're rich towards God. And I mean, look, God is watching. And what you... Did Jesus not say that, that, that... Truth from Matthew 6.21. Where your treasure is, what? There your heart is. Don't think you're the exception. If your heart is with Christ, if you love Him chiefly, your wallet and your purse are going to follow. Your bank accounts are going to follow. It's true. You're not the exception. You're not. Those that go to glory, they're going to show by the use of their money what they love the most. And this man, this fool, showed what he loved the most. His own pleasure. And we live in an age that is pleasure-driven. Young people. We have young people. You could make sacrifices when it comes to cell phones or the tennis shoes you wear. Lots of decisions that you make show who you're consumed with primarily. God is watching. I mean, when you make sacrifices, He is honored when it's coming forth, not from you trying to merit your way through, but when it comes as a cheerful giver. Because, I mean, have you heard the, oh, sacred head, now wounded. That song, what language shall we borrow to thank thee, dearest friend? And I was thinking about this. The language of money is one we can borrow to thank our friend. Your, your, your heart, the way you cherish Him, the love you have for Him, it is expressed by what you do with money. Or your lack of it is expressed. Did did you hear those words? Rich toward God. Does, Does that sum up how you handle riches and wealth? Rich towards God. Because if you're taking your best of your earthly possessions and you're using them for the kingdom of Christ, it just speaks volumes about where your heart is. And brethren, God's all about motive. It's not about the amount. You may be like that widow who could only throw in two copper coins. It's not the amount. It's, it is the amount in the sense that her amount was all she had. And that's what God wants from you. God does not want part He wants all of you. As I I heard Paul Washer say before, God is a jealous lover. He wants your love. He wants your heart. 
And if he has it, your money is just, it's, it's going to follow. And God is watching all the time. And you can tell, when you don't bring the polluted thing, you bring the best thing. When you get a raise and you're like, I know this raise came from the Lord and I'm giving Him of the first fruits. And I rejoice. Not, oh yeah, now I can get that new thing I wanted. Does that sound more like the fool in Luke 12? Oh, brethren, brethren, if you are wise, you know who you're wise for? For you. And if you're a fool, you're a fool for you. And if what you're doing, that man who's called a fool in Luke 12, he was all about what he could get here. He was all about living for the here and now. That's a fool. When you have been given that by which you can honor God, and be wise for yourself. And be wise for eternity. Money bags that never grow old. For God to have brought His own honor and connected it so intimately with your honor and your good. Oh, what wisdom. Brethren, I just say this. Be wise for yourselves and how you handle money. Be wise. In the decisions we make as a church, we need to be wise. I'll tell you, this is about honoring God. It's not about getting a building first and foremost. How we get a building, if we get a building, needs to be looked at strategically as to how God can be honored. Not how we can become like the rest of the world just so that we can get a building. It's all, you remember George Mueller was all about this. George Mueller did not go into the orphan business primarily because he had a burden for orphans. You know what he primarily had a burden for? Honoring God. And he thought if there's a way to honor God and prove God's faithfulness, it's through orphans. We need to be thinking that all the time. We need to be thinking about, hey, when I hear about a building... I immediately think, oh, there's an opportunity to honor the Lord. When I think about financial meetings, I'm thinking about there's an opportunity to honor the Lord. And when people make suggestions that sound to me like the way the world does things, which has no regard for the honor of the Lord, you will find I dismiss those ideas rather quickly. And it's not to be rude. It's not to be offensive. It's because I have a very specific agenda in what our church does with money. I want to see God honored. I want us to... I want us to, brethren, I want our church to be sacrificial and I want us to be walking by faith. I want us to be giving and meeting the needs of one another. I want us to be mindful to the poor, to the needy, those who sit in darkness. If there's any need, it's spiritual need. Oh, God, help us to send more missionaries to the real needy in this world. Brethren, let us be wise. And if you're wise, you're wise for yourself. Father, I pray that You would help us. Oh, may we be a wise people. Lord, we want to honor You. I want to honor You. Lord, I do want to honor You. I want to honor Christ with my money, with my life, with my all. Lord, give us grace. Give us wisdom. This wisdom, Lord, that we've been talking about, the wisdom to with a joyful heart, with a cheerful heart, as cheerful givers, sacrificial givers, may we have the grace to live to Your honor and glory in the love of Christ. Amen.